All right, so uh, let's get started. Uh, I'm here to talk about my work in the last four years on training, evaluating, and understanding evolutionary models for protein sequences. Um, so really throughout this talk and throughout my PhD, I've been trying to answer three main questions, which are do standard approaches to unsupervised learning and natural language processing, NLP, learn biologically relevant features? How can we tailor the data, model, and tasks that are used to train unsupervised models for proteins? And can large-scale unsupervised models for protein sequences be made useful in actual wet lab design? Before I dive into neural models and all of the work that we've done uh, in the last couple of years, let me start by talking about evolutionary models of protein sequences in general and kind of history of the field. And the question that I want to use to get at this is, what is the observed distribution of protein sequences? So what do I mean by this? Um, well, if I go out and ask you to give me a bunch of protein sequences, where does that come from? So you can go out and look at a database of protein sequences uh, like PFAM or UNIRAF, and these databases are, are created by lots of scientists around the world going out and depositing the proteins that they sequence in lab into a central repository. Alternatively, uh, if you're interested in COVID uh, sequencing results in a particular area of the world, maybe you want to monitor which variants are more present uh, and, and which variants are propagating better, you might go out and, and get a database of all of the sequencing results in a particular area. Or you might go out and look at someone's microbiome or, or look at a kind of an area of, uh, of dirt and just kind of sequence everything in that area and, and look at all the protein sequences there and call that a data set. So what do all of these things have in common? Uh, these things all have in common that they're the product of evolution. Um, and evolution has these three, uh, or these three components that I'm gonna break things down into, which are mutation, selection, and observation. Um, so what we see at the end is, is some sort of database, and that is what we observe. Um, but what's happening is that you have initial protein sequences that get mutated through insertions of new amino acids, deletions of uh, uh, existing amino acids, or substitutions where one amino acid is modified to another. And I'm going to kind of be using this uh, multicolored squares as a cartoon for proteins throughout this talk. Um, but OK, so you make this uh, set of mutations. Um, that's not a super interesting thing to model because the mutational process is at least somewhat random. You expect mutations to occur um, throughout the, the protein roughly uniformly. Um, and uh, that, that's not necessarily very useful to model to, to get any information about a specific protein. On the other hand, what you see is that not every protein that gets mutated will actually survive in the real world. Some of them will kind of fail to function and will result in the organism uh, failing to survive. Uh, and so this is really the selection process. I, uh, what you observe is kind of the original ancestral protein that, that mutated and then some mutants that, uh, that managed to survive. And so when you create a database uh, or create a model on your database of observed protein sequences, what you are doing is creating a model of selection. You're creating a model of evolutionary fitness. And that's what all of the things that we're going to be talking about are going to be doing today. So let's talk a bit about the kind of data structures and the underlying uh, data that we're going to be using to think about protein sequences. Uh, and one of the biggest things here is the multiple sequence alignment. Uh, and what this is, is let's say I have a particular protein that I'm interested in, say this uh, a protein in, in fish, and I can go out and I can find a lot of similar proteins from different species, so humans, cats, uh, starfish, bacteria, et cetera. And then I can go and I can use something like edit distance or similarity between these sequences to align them all together into this kind of 2D arrangement. So what if uh, this 2D arrangement can provide us a lot of information about a protein sequence. So what information can it provide? Right off the bat, the kind of simplest way of modeling a protein would be an independent sites model, sometimes called a PSFM, where what you do is you treat every position in the protein sequence, so every column, 
in the uh, alignment as independent of one another. Um, and you try and understand uh, different sites in a protein as, as kind of in, totally independent of one another. So what happens if you do this? Well, uh, you look at the first column and you see, okay, there's 60% of this blue protein, 40% of this yellow or yellow amino acid, and 0% of everything else. Okay, maybe that's interesting. Uh, but the real key here in this cartoon at least is in the second column, I observe 100% of the red amino acid and 0% of everything else. Now, if this is a, a real a multiple sequence alignment with hundreds of proteins and you observe a phenomenon like this, then that tells you that because mutations should be randomly distributed, the fact that you don't observe any mutations at that position means that any mutations that did occur resulted in the protein failing to function and the organism dying. Uh, and so that uh, site you immediately identified as, as highly important to the function of the protein, where it's a site that cannot tolerate any mutation. Um, what else is on this slide? So you see above uh, uh, in, in an MRF representation where you have every site you know, zero through three listed as uh, an individual node with no connections between them to model the fact for independence. Um, you can write down the likelihood of this really easily. Um, and then you have a sequence logo at the top, which is a super easy way of visualizing this type of data. Um, what you see is different positions in the protein where the is uh, inversely proportional to the entropy of that position. So low entropy positions are likely important. They can't tolerate mutations, so they are relatively high in the logo. High entropy positions uh, can tolerate a lot of mutations, so they're probably a little bit less important, and so they're relatively lower in the logo. And then finally, the uh, height of the amino acid in each is proportional to the frequency uh, of the amino acid at that position. So it summarizes the information in this uh, independent sites model very well. Okay, I've just told you that I'm gonna model a protein as a set of independent amino acids that don't interact at all. Uh, and that's not super satisfying because that's obviously not how a protein really works. Um, so what's the kind of next steps that we can go? And how can we learn a little bit more about these interactions between amino acids and, and maybe with an eye towards learning the actual 3D structure of the protein? Uh, well, that's where a pairwise sites model, or what I'll be calling a POTS model, uh, comes into play. So we look at the same multiple sequence alignment here. Um, and now if we look at the columns one and or the, the first and the fourth columns of this alignment, uh, we see that wherever there is a blue amino acid in one, there must be a yellow amino acid in the other and vice versa. And so this suggests that there is some sort of underlying relationship between these two positions that restricts which amino acids can be at those pairs of positions together. So there's an underlying, there's a statistical relationship between these two columns, but that implies that there is a real 3D physical relationship between the columns that provides the mechanism uh, that allows this kind of statistical relationship to manifest in the data. Um, and you can visualize this as a Markov random field again, where you now have uh, edges between all the nodes to denote that there is some sort of interaction there. It's kind of hard to write down the exact likelihood of this model uh, because you have an undirected graphical model here, uh, but you can write down the pseudo likelihood. So what you would do is maximize the probability of each amino acid given all uh, other amino acids in the uh, sequence and do that independently for each amino acid. Uh, and then up above, uh, one way of visualizing these models is as a contact map where uh, you basically look at pairs of positions that are highly interacting or which you infer to be highly interacting and, and, and suggest that that might have something to do with the 3D structure of the protein. And I'll, I'll get into exactly how you do that in, in the next couple of slides. So something I'm gonna be referencing a lot that proteins have a three-dimensional structure, uh, obviously. Um, and the 3D structure of the protein uh, is very important when you're designing models because uh, amino acids that are distant in sequence space, uh, so these kind of highlighted green amino acids, might be really close together in three-dimensional space. Um, and one way we can determine uh, how well a model is understanding a protein is by looking at contact prediction. So what a contact prediction, a contact map is an adjacency matrix. 
you put a one at a pair at, at a position if uh, the amino acids at that corresponding position uh, are physically close together uh, or in contact. So these two amino acids correspond to 110th and 147th amino acids uh, in this particular protein. So I can go and look at the adjacency matrix right here and see, yes, there is a dot here that corresponds to the contact between these two uh, amino acids. Um, what you see uh, as this visualization is that on the bottom right is the uh, true adjacency matrix. On the top left is a prediction where blue dots are true positives, red dots are false positives, and gray dots are uh, kind of uh, are the ground truth. Um, and then you, what I'm going to be talking about as a metric throughout this is called precision at L, which is a, a measure that goes from zero to one or zero to a hundred, um, and basically that the higher the better. Um, so this is going to be one of the primary metrics that we use for that. All right, that was a lot of background, uh, but let's dive into the actual work that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and, and to do that, let's start with the question, do standard approaches to unsupervised learning in NLP learn biologically relevant features? So what is the standard approach to unsupervised learning in NLP, and how do I apply that to protein? Um, well, the standard approach to learning in NLP is to take a, a neural network and to train that on a database of sequences. Uh, that's typically English sentences, uh, but we can substitute in protein sequences represented by single letters for each amino acid uh, very, very easily. And what you would do is you would take a protein sequence, you would mask out random positions in that sequence, and you would have it predict uh, what, what amino acid should go in those sequences. Now, if you do this on English, then you learn a lot of things about sentence uh, structure, word order, and grammar. Um, the question that we're really asking is if you do the same thing on proteins, you know, you forgo building an MSA, you forgo training uh, or looking at independent sites or POTS models, and you just train this type of model on a database of protein sequences, do you learn anything useful? Um, now, I said you forgo the relate or you forgo pairwise sites models, uh, and you're just going to do this neural network thing. Uh, but let's if we think about it a little bit more carefully, we're actually not straying as far from the previous work as you might think. Uh, if you look, for example, at the pseudo likelihood objective that you would use to train a pairwise sites model, uh, you're really maximizing the probability of each amino acid given all of the other amino acids in the protein. But if you look at a mass language modeling uh, objective, what you're doing is you're maximizing the probability of all of the masked amino acids given all of the unmasked amino acids. So you can really think about this almost as an approximation to the uh, pseudo likelihood objective that you would use to train a pairwise sites model. Um, and I'll, I'll bring up some connections to, to pairwise sites models uh, with uh, mass language modeling uh, again later in the talk. Now, if we look back at where the field was in early 2019 when we started this work, we had a couple of different papers that had all done you know, variations on the same idea of taking a neural network, training it on a bunch of protein sequences, and evaluating it on some uh, different tasks uh, and, and seeing whether that was useful. Um, but the big problem with all of these papers is that they use very different architectures. They train them on different uh, data, bit, data sets with, you know, for different amounts of time, and they evaluated them in, in totally different ways. And so it's very difficult to look at, the, uh, at these different papers and actually compare them well uh, against one another. And that brought us to the question of how we evaluate a neural evolutionary model. Um, and the approach that we took is to do something very much like uh, you would do in, in machine learning uh, and introduce something like glue for uh, proteins, which we called tape, um, and uh, essentially was a set of benchmark tasks uh, which you can see below, from different areas of protein biology that try to evaluate how well a protein evolutionary model uh, was doing at predicting uh, at these types of, you know, important protein uh, tasks. So what do we see from, from this work, uh, from this very initial work? Um, well, we saw that if you 
take a uh, model for uh, various different types of neural network architectures on all five of these different tasks, and you train that model uh, on a database of protein sequences for a while, and you compare that to the same model, but without training it on that database of protein sequences, uh, then you see a significant performance boost. Uh, so definitely, in, in pretty much all cases, you see an increase in performance after doing pre-training. The thing that really surprised us, though, is that if we took the independent sites model features, which again are, are just looking at these, building these multiple sequence alignments for a protein, and then uh, looking at the, uh, you know, the, the, the frequencies of each amino acid at each position, uh, those were actually much, much more useful uh, especially for structure-based uh, evaluations than our fancy neural network uh, with lots of free training. So that was pretty surprising. Now, we found these uh, results, um, and they told us some things. They told us that we were learning something about protein structure and function, but uh, maybe not as much as, uh, uh, as existing methods. But we really didn't have... Uh, a good sense still of how this data and how, what information exactly these models were learning and how that information was being represented. So is there a way that we can take a closer look and look a bit more directly at these models uh, to try and understand what exactly it is that they are learning? So to do that, uh, we can dive into something uh, very specific, which is the attention mechanism in a transformer neural network. Um, so what this is, is that a transformer passes information uh, by looking at pair at each position or at each input independently, uh, and then passing information, constructing a pairwise similarity matrix between these inputs and then passing information uh, between uh, these pairs of inputs. Uh, and it does that repeatedly. So you have one layer where you do it multiple times, and then you do that over and over and over again. And each one of these similarity matrices is called an attention hat. Um, and what a group out of Salesforce actually did was to analyze the transformer model that we trained in, in the previous paper. Uh, and they were able to show that a particular attention head of this model learned to represent protein contact. So the amino acids that it said were similar to one another tended to be amino acids that were physically close in 3D space. Okay, that was really interesting to us, but you know we, that was not a. We wanted to benchmark and understand again how well is this model doing compared to existing approaches to predicting uh, 3D structure without any type of, of additional uh, supervision. Um, and the the standard approach to doing that is that POS model, the pairwise sites model that I discussed at the beginning. Um, so. What we did here is we took a bunch of different protein structures. So each dot on this graph represents a different protein uh, structure. Um, and then we took, trained a POS model. We generated a multiple sequence alignment and trained a POS model uh, for each of those different uh, proteins. Um, now, on the other hand, we could also take uh, the tape transformer, which we only had to train one time, and just pass the individual proteins into the tape transformer. So this model only gets the first protein in the alignment uh, as input. Now, if you, and then finally, we color all of these dots by the depth of the multiple sequence alignment, uh, because that's the amount of data that was available to train this POS model. So what we find is, is again, a, something of a similar story to uh, what we found in the original tape paper, which is that this transformer model does learn to predict protein structure. There is, at least to some degree, uh, some, uh, some level at which the model is able to predict protein structure. However, uh, it's still not performing nearly as well as the standard approach to structure prediction uh, uh, or to unsupervised uh, structure prediction in this field. Um, so yes, while with the POTS model, you do have to go out and generate a multiple sequence alignment and train a model for every point here. If you go to that effort, you get much better results. Okay, uh, well, we are in deep learning and we work with neural networks. So what, we, what do we do when our model isn't working well? We scale it up. Uh, so uh, we start out with a 40 million parameter model originally uh, that was trained on, on protein domains. 
Um, and then we wanted to try this out with a 650 million parameter model that's trained on full protein sequences. So it's more than 10 times as big. Now, what did we find when we analyzed this much larger model? Well, we found some really interesting results. So what I'm doing here is showing a heat map uh, of the different, uh, uh, different pairwise similarity matrices, the different attention heads in this transformer model. As you go on the x-axis, you see the uh, attention head number, which is kind of, you know, uh, these are arbitrary, so the, the attention heads are not ordered. Uh, but as you go on the y-axis, you see the layer in the model, and as you get farther up on the y-axis, you get farther uh, towards the end of the neural network. Uh, and really what we see is that there are a large number of attention heads towards the end of the neural network that seem to be predictive of protein contact, of protein structure. Um, and individually, they're all actually quite predictive of protein structure, but maybe we can do better by actually combining the information from different attention heads together to, to make a single prediction for the entire model. Uh, yeah. Uh, so how are you actually like testing the other things? Yeah. Yeah. So let me repeat the question, which is how are you actually testing here? Whether uh, the attention uh, is actually predictive of protein contact. Um, and so what we do here is we have a small kind of validation set of 20 proteins, and then we evaluate on that set how, how well each different attention head. We basically directly use the attention as the prediction of protein contacts, and we evaluate this metric, this precision at L metric, uh, of each intention head independently on that validation set. Um, so that's exactly literally what's being shown here is the precision at L of each individual attention head on this small validation set. Um, and so we can combine all of this information into a single prediction by introducing a small amount of supervision, uh, specifically using logistic regression. We can add one parameter per attention head uh, and then train that, uh, uh, train that logistic regression using a very small amount of data to predict protein contact. Um, because most of the features, most of the information is learned during the pre-training process, we're just using the attention map, all the logistic regression has to do is figure out which uh, attention heads are predictive of protein contact. As a result, you really need very, very little data to do this well. So using that same validation set for training, and then in, this is showing an example from the, the test set, um, you go from one to kind of 20 training structures, uh, and you see a, a increase in, in performance uh, up to a uh, percentage in L of 89.6. Uh, pretty rapidly. Uh, so this, uh, this is a, a really simple way of aggregating the information across the different attention heads. And th this is interesting to us because it's the first time we've really been able to get a result where a language model, at least on average, seems to be doing better than the uh, standard uh, approach, the, the POPS model to predicting protein contacts and, and, and predicting this type of 3D structure information. Um, and it's nice because uh, you're really reducing the amount of time you need to make these predictions uh, since they can now be done in a single forward pass on a GPU rather than uh, through a complicated procedure where you go out, generate an MSA and train a separate model for each protein. Now, I said that you don't have to go out and generate an MSA and train a separate model for each protein. But let's compare how well uh, the ESM uh, model, which, is, uh, which takes only a single protein sequence as input uh, in, does relative to a POPs model at, depth, at different MSA depths. Uh, and specifically what we're doing here is we're binning protein sequences by the depth of the MSA that was used to train the POPs model. So obviously you should expect to see a strong correlation between the POTS model performance and, uh, and MSA depth because the, the MSA depth is exactly the amount of data used to train the POTS model. However, we observe a similar strong correlation between the language model, the ESM-1B model, uh, and MSA depth, despite the fact that ESM-1B takes only a single protein sequence as input and it does not directly take in an MSA as input. Um, and so 
The reasoning behind this is that you can almost think of ESM1B and these language models or these evolutionary models as sort of amortized POTS models. What you're doing uh, is that the depth of an MSA uh, is sort of a proxy for the amount of similar data available to the model in its training set. Um, because an MSA is generated by searching a protein sequence database for similar protein sequences. So if you have a low depth MSA, it means there are few similar sequences in a sequence database, but that's exactly the database that we're using to train ESM uh, on. And so you still see that uh, despite the fact that you're only taking a single sequence as input, there's a strong correlation between the model's performance and uh, the performance you would get if you were to generate an MSA and train a, a pairwise type model. Circling back to the original question of whether standard approaches to unsupervised learning and NLP learn biologically relevant features, at this point, I think the answer is clearly yes. We can talk about whether these are useful, but I, I, we clearly see that the take transformer is learning some things about protein uh, structure and that ESM1B achieves essentially parity with existing approaches uh, for predicting protein contact. Okay, so we've shown some results where those that are maybe initially promising, but they're again using relatively off the shelf methods for from natural language processing. Uh, and, and I want to ask how we can tailor the data model and tasks that are used to train unsupervised models for protein. And then specifically the next project that I'm going to talk about was inspired by the question of, of why it takes so many parameters, uh, 650 million parameter neural network to compete with these relatively simple pairwise sites models. So the analogy I like to use here is zero shot question answering. Um, now imagine you're training a GPT language model or, or imagine you're a human and I want to ask you a question and uh, I need you to give me the answer. Uh, and if I just ask you a, ra a random question, you know, who is the 32nd president of the United States? Um, what did you need to have done in order to be able to provide me the answer? Well, you need to have kind of read a large amount of text and memorize that information in some way. Um, and in the case of a neural network, that needs to be stored in the parameters of the neural network. So you need a lot of uh, parameters to store that type of information. On the other hand, if I ask you a sort of SAT question where I give you a a question, but I also give you a document which contains the answer to that question. Now all you have to do is extract the relevant information from the document. Um, and in the case of modeling, you can probably use something much simpler, uh, maybe something like textual similarity to find a sentence that likely has the answer that you're looking for. Uh, and similarly, when I uh, multiple sequence alignment contains a large amount of information about protein structure through these pairwise statistical relationships, and so the POTS model just needs to extract this information from its input rather than predicting it wholesale. So this is the, uh, this is the inspiration for the next model, the MSA transformer, which tries to really uh, have the best of both worlds. So you wanna be able to take in a multiple sequence alignment as input, it contains a lot of useful information that you wanna use to make your prediction. On the other hand, uh, you also, want a model that's able to bring in information from other proteins to, uh, to actually uh, incorporate that information and into its predictions uh, so that it can make the best prediction possible. In order to do this, you need to adapt the model slightly um, because standard attention is very expensive. It's, it's quadratic in the number of uh, tokens of input, which is fine when you're taking in a single protein sequence, but a multiple sequence alignment can have tens of thousands of uh, amino acids in it uh, from, from all of the different proteins. Uh, so it's, it's really too prohibitive to, to uh, do a full attention update on this uh, entire operation. Um, so what we're gonna do instead is we're going to pass information selectively along the uh, rows and columns of this uh, alignment independently, which will reduce uh, the computational and memory costs by an order of magnitude. Um, and then we're going to further reduce this by actually just subsampling the multiple sequence alignment uh, in order to allow uh, us to fit it uh, on a GPU and, and actually train this model. 
And again, we're just going to train this using mass language modeling applied uniformly across the entire input. Okay, that's one thing that we can do, and we can apply this, and, and it will kind of work. Um, but we can maybe do better than that uh, by looking at a particular observation, which is that different sequences in a multiple sequence alignment share the same structure. Um, and we also saw in the previous section of the talk that uh, transformers like to learn or tend to learn uh, uh, contact maps, the 3D structure of a protein, inside of their attention uh, map. Um, and so instead of allowing each, uh, each sequence in a uh, transformer or in, in this model to uh, have an independent uh, similarity map, an independent attention map, we can instead tie all of these together using a relatively simple uh, re uh, reduce operation uh, to have uh, to, to require that every single uh, structure share the same or every single sequence share the same structure. Now, if we uh, look at, uh, at what this inductive bias does, well, we start out by looking at some baselines of, of the, the POP model, achieving 39.3% uh, precision, um, ESM1B achieving 41.1. If we just use the standard untied uh, attention, uh, update uh, without this optimization I described in the previous slide, we hit a precision of 42.1 after just 100,000 updates and using, you know, a fraction of the number of parameters. If we incorporate this uh, additional optimization uh, by using a mean reduction, then uh, we achieve a pre uh, precision at L of 50.1, is significantly higher. And if we actually use a square root based reduction, uh, then that jumps things up to 56.3. Um, so you see a significant increase in performance, both by using this the MSA as input, but also by uh, enforcing uh, as part of an inductive bias in the model that these different sequences share the same structure. Uh, yeah, so the question was whether we're using logistic regression over the attention heads for the MSA transformer. And yes, that, that's the same uh, methodology that we're using here. Um, again, we can kind of bin things by the depth of the MSA used to train the POP model. Uh, we still see some strong correlation with MSA depth, but it's, it's less than uh, with uh, the other model, suggesting that you know, you're, it's able to incorporate uh, information from elsewhere for these low depth sequences. Um, and, uh, but, and it's also just significantly better for, for a kind of all MSA depth uh, at, at predicting protein contact. Uh, it does get better as you add more sequences into the uh, alignment. So uh, this goes from uh, one sequence in the alignment up to 1,024. Uh, but, but what's interesting is that this kind of plateaus somewhere between you know, 16 and 256 sequences. Um, whereas a typical uh, POS model requires a, at least a thousand sequences to make its best prediction. Um, and uh, really overall, what we have been able to show is uh, this kind of progression over time of these different models where we started out with the tape transformer, you know, able to make some contact predictions, but, but kind of struggling. Um, moving on to ESM1B, which got scaled up and made better predictions uh, on parity with the POS model. And finally, the MSA transformer, which essentially outperforms the POS model on, on all models. All right, so uh, moving on to the last, sec last question here, uh, uh, which is, can large scale unsupervised models for protein sequences be made useful in actual wet lab design? Um, so, what, how, how do you do actual wet lab design? Well, there's a lot of ways of doing this, but one way I'm going to talk about is directed evolution, uh, which is where you essentially do the standard evolutionary process, but you are going to define the selection mechanism and, and to some extent the mutation mechanism as well. You start from an existing protein sequences, you make some mutations that you either randomly or mutations that you think are likely to increase the function, uh, some function that you're interested in. You uh, artificially select the, uh, the proteins that seem to uh, function best uh, according to whatever you're interested in. Uh, 
you add that to your database and then you repeat this process over and over again until you have a sequence that matches the criteria that you're interested in. Now, what's the uh, problem with this? Well, the problem is that you definitely can't do any exhaustive search of this landscape. Um, you can make a, a mutation at every position in the, or you can make up to you know, 20 uh, mutations at every position in the a protein. Uh, a typical protein has you know, hundreds of amino acids. So even doing uh, exhaustive researching through all three or four uh, combinations of mutations uh, would be very prohibitive. Um, so that means that you either have to uh, settle for kind of some sort of greedy optimization like in direct evolution, uh, or you need to have some sort of heuristic where you can pre-scan mutants uh, in, 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 a, in a computer and say, okay, I think these are going to be likely to uh, uh, function well. And, uh, and that will, and if we can pre-scan those and we don't have to generate them in the lab and we can focus our efforts on the, the mutants that uh, our models think are likely to perform well. Um, so how do we do this with evolutionary models? Well, if we think back to the beginning of, of the talk, um, we said that evolutionary models are models of uh, selection of functional fitness. Um, and so the likelihood of a protein sequence under an evolutionary model uh, should be the, the model's belief that this is a real you know, natural protein. Um, and so we can hypothesize that likelihood uh, should at least to some extent correlate with whether or not a protein is functional and how functional that protein is. Um, so again, we can, you know, we've defined a couple of different ways to look at, uh, to, to get the likelihood of a protein under the model. With a independent sites model, we can write down an exact likelihood. Uh, with a pseudo likelihood based model, you can, you know, get the pseudo likelihood. Um, uh, with mass language modeling, it's slightly uh, odd because you now have a random masking probability here. Um, and so every time you evaluate this mask, you're going to get a, a different probability depending on what the mask is. So that's not ideal, but we can essentially turn this into a pseudo likelihood by uh, masking every single amino acid in the protein independently, uh, running a forward pass, evaluating the probability of that amino acid, uh, and then going on to the next. Uh, and so this uh, takes a, a mass language model and allows you to get a pseudo likelihood out of that. Um, the kind of last thing uh, to talk about here is uh, kind of uh, is, a, is a small detail, but, but which actually has a big impact on the final result. Um, and that's that protein sequences are not independent and identically distributed, even in a protein sequence database, uh, because people, you know, biologists don't work on all organisms and all uh, types of proteins uh, at, at, you know, uniform frequency. Instead, there are certain model organisms and certain proteins that are studied much more than others. Um, and so a, a database is going to contain clusters of sequences that occur much more frequently and are, and are very, very similar to one another. And if you train a database, a, a model on this raw data, you're likely to overfit to one of those clusters. Now, we found that uh, for, uh, uh, for these, uh, for, for structure prediction, uh, clustering all of this data at a 50% similarity threshold uh, works really well. Uh, but for the case of mutation uh, and variant effect prediction, you actually want a slightly higher threshold because you're really trying to get the model to be able to distinguish between the likelihood of very, very similar mutations uh, between, uh, or very, very small mutations in a protein sequence. And so having a higher uh, density where the model is trained on more similar sequences uh, it allows the model to make a slightly better inferences in this case when it needs to distinguish between these two similar proteins. Okay, uh, what did we find? What were the results of this method? Um, so this shows a, a 40 different uh, uh, protein functional assays on very different proteins uh, and, and different uh, types of, of protein function in each case. Uh, on the x-axis, you see the different assays, and on the y-axis, you see the correlation 
between the, uh, evolu the, the likelihood sequences under uh, our model uh, in dark blue uh, uh, against the, the function of interest here. And there are a couple of things that I want to pull out here. So the model that we uh, use in this uh, work is a single sequence model. So it takes only the protein sequence that you're interested in, evaluates that sequence, and returns to you the likelihood. Uh, so the advantage of that is that it's extremely fast. Uh, you can get an evaluation for your entire set of mutants in, uh, you know, in minutes. Um, and, uh, and so that's really useful when you want to scan thousands and thousands of mutants or, or even millions of mutants. Um, the model that we're comparing to at a baseline is a multiple sequence alignment based model that is, you know, expensive to generate that alignment um, and expensive to train uh, the model and actually expensive to infer the results uh, on top of this model. Um, and what this uh, really does is, uh, and, and we're able to achieve parity between uh, the uh, single sequence model and this more expensive alignment based model. Um, uh, and so, sorry, there's a question that I think I missed a while ago of why not use the protein data bank? Um, that is used for structure in all cases. The question, uh, the reason you'd want to do structure prediction would be to uh, predict structures of proteins that aren't in the protein data bank. Um, uh, sorry about that. Um, sorry for missing that question. Uh, okay, so the baseline we're comparing to uses a multiple sequence alignment. Um, but what we find, however, is that if we take our model and actually train it further on the multiple sequence alignment, um, then in some cases you see a significant boost in performance. Um, so going from this blue all the way up to this, uh, or this dark blue all the way up to the light blue. So that suggests that uh, you're still seeing the same phenomenon uh, of, uh, of kind of limited capacity where the model is not able to remember all of the information in its training data set. Um, and so that providing it with that information through a little bit of additional training on the multiple sequence alignment allows it to improve its predictions and make better results. Um, so you still see that these single sequence models are really, really fast, uh, but they have some limited capacity by the fact that they have to make all their inferences from a single sequence. Okay, future direction. Um, and where do I want to go next with all of this? Um, I think it's very hard to talk about future directions without talking about AlphaFold right now. Um, and AlphaFold is really interesting because it does have significant evolutionary components. Um, this whole component of the AlphaFold uh, uh, model is actually quite similar to the MSA transformer uh, architecture that I discussed earlier. It has some additional bells and whistles, um, but, but you can think of them as broadly similar. Um, and so they kind of should have similar properties. Um, what's maybe really interesting with AlphaFold is that there's an additional 3D structure model uh, module that allows it to uh, model uh, the physical interactions between different amino acids, uh, perhaps, and, and perhaps allows for a different type of generalization. Um, so this is an example of AlphaFold on a protein complex, which is two independent proteins that are uh, that interact with one another. Now, AlphaFold was not trained on protein complexes. It was only trained on individual proteins. And additionally, evolutionary data is, tends to be much worse for, uh, evolution, for, for protein complexes because you have to get uh, uh, data about these, pro, uh, about these proteins evolving together in context rather than data of the evolution of each protein indep indep independently. Um, and in this example, AlphaFold is not provided with this, you know, contextual data uh, of pairs of proteins evolving together. Uh, instead, it was only provided with the individual evolutionary data of the two proteins. Um, but despite the fact, you know, AlphaFold is predicting this really, really well. You see that the, the blue and green are the crystal structure of this protein, and the, the pink uh, is the AlphaFold prediction. Um, so how is it able to make these types of predictions, despite the fact that it's quite different from anything that it should have been trained on, 
Um, and so my hypothesis here is that AlphaFold is adding a new type of generalization uh, based on the, the similarity between 3D structural motifs, which is that it's not, it, it, there is no evolutionary data here to make your generalization on, but the interactions between these two uh, proteins are, uh, are similar uh, in 3D space to interactions within an individual protein um, are similar enough that AlphaFold is able to infer the correct positioning of these two pairs of proteins, of these two proteins uh, in complex. And I think this is really one of the key uh, next steps for the field, which is, you know, evolutionary signals are clearly very useful. They provide you enormous amounts of information, but they will are limited fundamentally. Uh, we want to be able to uh, model how a protein interacts with other molecules, whether that's other proteins or other small molecules. Um, we want to know how a protein responds to changes in environment. What happens if I increase the temperature from 40 Celsius to 100 Celsius? What happens to this protein? Uh, what happens if I increase the pH? Or, or the, uh, and then what happens uh, when I try and design a protein uh, to kind of exceed what typically is found in nature? So I might want a protein that is stable at 100 Celsius and uh, can be, uh, you know, is highly, highly soluble so that I can fit a lot of it into a relatively small solution. Um, and, and evolutionary signals are going to, by design, be limited uh, in, in, in their ability to answer these questions. So I think that the key question for me will be how we incorporate these evolutionary signals into the, uh, into the models that we build and, and work with. So in conclusion, um, we identified multiple different ways to evaluate these types of evolutionary models. We found that there were significant gaps between uh, neural networks and the classical models or, uh, or classical evolutionary models. We were able to surpass some of these classical approaches by modifying the data and the models. Um, and then we hope, uh, or I hope to continue working to improve generalization uh, of these sequences outside the bounds of evolutionary models. All right, so uh, on to the sappy part of this talk, uh, which is the thank yous. Um, so the first thank you I'm gonna say here is to uh, you know the people who, uh, at least in the last couple of years, I was able to connect with um, through COVID, uh, if, you know, there's one silver lining here is it really kind of flattened the distance between all people uh, and allowed me to work with a lot of people from around the world that I would never have been able to work with in the past. And that's made, you know, the last couple of years uh, a lot more engaging than it would have been otherwise. So thank you all very much. Uh, you know, Alex, Josh, Tom, uh, Sergey, and, and everyone else for, for uh, doing this with me. Um, Nick and Neil. Uh, you guys, I should put Philippe on this slide too for introducing us, but uh, you guys, you know, uh, got me started or, or helped me get started on the journey for protein, uh, on proteins. Um, I think this would have been a lot less fun without all of you uh, there with me, and I'm so glad that we got to do this together. Um, John and Peter, uh, you know, I really started going further and further away from your research areas. And uh, I always wondered whether, you know, I'd go too far and you'd be uh, inclined to, to pull me back and say, you know, that's, that's enough, uh, get, get back to work. And, and you kind of never did. Uh, you really gave me a lot of freedom to explore and, and to build my own, own path. And, and thank you so much for, for doing that and uh, for, for giving me that, that support. Um, David, Tandon, uh, Forrest, Haley, Ian, Celia, uh, you guys have, you know, really made grad school a lot more fun than it could have been. Uh, and I, as much as I, uh, you know, ha have enjoyed this time, I think I'll definitely, if, there, if there's definitely one thing that I'll miss about uh, leaving Berkeley, it's, it's leaving all of you guys uh, uh, behind. And so, uh, I'll miss all of you. Um, and then 
to my family, to Nisa and, and Amma who are uh, tuning into this from the East Coast, and, and to my dad, Anna, who's, uh, who's uh, uh, tuning into this from India at 5.30 a.m. Uh, thank you so much for, for always cheering my successes, for listening to me when I was worried and, and frustrated. Um, and you've really, really uh, helped me throughout my life throughout the last couple of years. And I'm very much looking forward to being a bit closer to home. So thank you all. Great work, great talk, Roshan. Um, let's open it up for questions. Uh, Haley. Is the main with those different things? Do you think the main barrier to being able to incorporate them the model complexity, or are there also areas where you need a lot more data or like standardized data? Yeah. So, so the question uh, for Shishat okay. is, uh, if you're, uh, what's the main barrier to uh, to incorporating this additional information that I talked about on the previous uh, section uh, uh, for these different models? Is it that these models need to be much more complex or is there a fundamental data limitation? Um, I think there is definitely a major data limitation here, which is uh, protein structural data is not clean, but it is uh, the kind of largest and most and cleanest of the soup kind of data types. Have that type of data available and it will be challenging to move on to these other modalities uh, where you have much less data available. Um, I think that, yeah, I, I think that there hasn't been that much serious effort to applying modern neural networks to some of these questions, uh, in part because the data has been not available or not easily accessible. Um, and so I think it's hard to answer the modeling capacity and architecture questions right now, but uh, that's that's kind of what what will need to happen next. I see a hand up in the Zoom, Roshan. Oh, uh, I... that was me. I think I wasn't sure if how the uh, the Zoom people should should ask questions. Uh, I, I will. I will get to Zoom. I think there's only two questions in in person. Then I'll get to Zoom right after. Cool. Contact. Oh. MSA. Is that the case, or? Uh, Russian, we cannot hear you online anymore. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK, so I guess the, the two microphones in person don't work. Um, so the, the question was, uh, was there uh, homologs in, in the benchmarks for structure prediction to be used um, uh, for the different benchmarks uh, for, uh, yeah. Um, so what I'll say is that uh, a couple of things. One, yes, probably uh, to some degree, they were data set diversity filtered, uh, but, but not as extensively as you might. Uh, so there's some degree of similarity, however, they, the models are, are not really supervised strongly. So it's not 100% clear how important that is. And then also in the papers, which I didn't go into detail in, we have results on tasks uh, and, and some better kind of data set evaluations, which are a lot more noisy because the number of sequences is much smaller, but then don't have these types of, uh, uh, of homologs 
Yeah, so, uh, you know, how confident am I that the, uh, if there were no correlations between the training and test test, or in terms of sequence similarity, that you'd see uh, some, some results? I think it's a really hard question. I think with the single sequence models, you would see no results or no, uh, basically zero prediction of performance. Um, with the, you know, if you can build an MSA, then, uh, you know, even if there's no correlation, I see MSA transformer and the POS model can work reasonably well. And we have results to show that that's the case. Um, and there is some confusion with kind of designed like de novo sequences, which on the one hand have no hom uh, homology to similar to, to known sequences, but on the other hand, seem incredibly easy to predict the structure of. Um, and, and the models do perform really well on those sequences. So that's maybe a bit of like a, uh, some people have described that as sort of the opposite of an adversarial case where uh, they're so easy to predict that almost any structural model will predict them successfully. Uh, so it's not 100% clear what's going on over there. Uh, okay, uh, Eddie, uh, you had a question? Yes, hello. First of all, excellent job. Uh, a quick, 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 sort of a clarifying question about how you train the logistic um, models on top of your, your, your attention maps. Mm -hmm. um, did you train those with a, with a held out sort of validation set of, of, of uh, MSAs or sequences, or were they refit on top of the original training set? Yeah, so uh, what we did is we, we have an initial model that's trained on a large data set of kind of uh, from Unira. Um, so that's trained on basically almost all known protein sequences. Then the and that's unsupervised. Then the logistic regression is trained on a set of 20 proteins that are randomly sampled from the set of 15,000 total proteins that we downloaded from the PDB. Um, and then the results are shown on the uh, remaining, you know, 14,000 some proteins that we evaluated against uh, uh, there. But, and all, all of those are presumably in the training set of the unsupervised model. Yes. So okay. all of those are likely to be in the training set of the unsupervised model. Uh, there are results on uh, CAS proteins in the paper, which are not in the training set of the unsupervised model because the training set of that model was generated from data uh, prior to the, that CAS year. OK, I see. Uh, but yeah, I, I didn't put those in the, in the talk. They are in the, uh, in the paper. I, I guess I was wondering if you think that the the overlaps within training sets there would help or hurt generalization, or if they're you know dissimilar enough tasks that it wouldn't matter. Um, I mean, I think that a single sequence language model is entirely doing its prediction based on like similarity to things that it's seen at training time. Um, and so, if you really have a protein sequence that is like so dissimilar to anything that you've seen at at, uh, at training time that you know, you couldn't generate a multiple sequence alignment for that model. I think you also couldn't see uh, a good performance from a single sequence model uh, in, in that case, um, or, or even from an MSA-based model for that matter. Um, so yes, I do think that they uh, rely on, you know, some level of overlap between the, the training and the, uh, and the test sets. Um, I guess the, the real question is like, what level is necessary? Is that you know, 70% similarity, 30% similarity. Um, you know, we have evidence that at relatively low similarities, you're still able to make some predictions. Uh, the MSA transformer especially does quite well uh, when trained on, on uh, when tested on CAS models, uh, on CAS proteins, where there should be relatively low similarity to things seen at training time. Um, and so, uh, so, so yes, yeah, so there should be, there are some ways that we evaluate this in, in the paper, uh, but uh, it's, it's a bit tricky to define exactly what you mean by similarity and what threshold you're willing to uh, allow. That makes sense. Thank you. All right. One more question in person. Are there any other questions on Zoom? I don't see any. Okay. Uh, yes, Hunter. Yeah, so the question is, it seems sad that uh, these large models really re almost require an MSA. Uh, 
to pick up this information well. Um, and that, uh, you know, it, in theory, with enough data, you should be able to infer the sequences. I mean, I think that's exactly what they're doing. I think they are in the sequences that uh, a single sequence model is effectively amortizing the process of uh, generating a, uh, going out, querying a database, generating an alignment, and training a pass model. I think that a, a forward pass of a model is like an amortized approximate inference uh, of that kind of pipeline. Um, the problem is that you are, you know, ESM 1D is 650 million parameters. Now that sounds like a lot, 650 million floating point numbers, unless you think about the fact that you're trying to compress all of UNRF 50 uh, into 650 million floating point numbers, uh, nine gigabytes, uh, and, and while also doing all of this, uh, you know, blast and search and POS modeling and uh, et cetera operation uh, in, that, in that same amount of space. Then it's maybe not so much like uh, if you view it more as a database compression algorithm and search algorithm than as a uh, as a neural network. Um, I think that, and I think that's kind of the fundamental limitation, which is that you are requiring these models to be big enough to to learn all of this information. Um, while also, you know, not overfitting to the largest sequences and while, you know, staying within your compute budgets and constraints, there's some suggestions from, from, uh, that, that if you go with, with higher, larger models, you can get like better results than some one b still. But, uh, but I think this is kind of like, you know, it, it, you see that in, in English language, like document-based question answers do a lot better at answering questions than, than, uh, uh, single sequence language models do. I think it's for the same reason. It's just that it's like very hard to memorize all this information. All right. I think uh, unless there are any further questions, I uh, might call it there. Thank you everyone for uh, for coming and uh, uh, thank you for, for your time. <laughs>